Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Andy Smith. Andy completed his Bachelor of Science in Agriculture with a Wildlife Resource major at McGill University. He started his career as a biologist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources in Quinty Conservation, Eastern Ontario, primarily working on fisheries and habitat issues on the Bay of Quinty, Lake Ontario. He then went on to complete his Master's of Science at the University of New Brunswick, where he studied nesting ecology of Greater Scott at Grassy Islands on the Lower St. John River. In 1998, Andy joined DFO as a fish habitat biologist working in both Ontario and in New Brunswick. Since 2007, Andy has been employed as an aquatic biologist with the Department of National Defense, 5th Canadian Support Group. He is located at Army Base Gagetown in South Central New Brunswick. The focus of his work is ensuring military training and base development comply with the Fisheries Act and other environmental legislation, fisheries and aquatic monitoring, and habitat restoration. After this afternoon's presentation, we'll be opening the floor for a question and answer session. You'll have the option of asking your questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Andy. Thank you, Darla. And thanks for everyone who's tuning in. Um, and okay, we already got a problem. Uh, doesn't want to move forward. Not okay, there we go. Okay, so so that would be me with my uh, puppy Annie, so everyone knows what I look like. It's always interesting on a webinar. You don't always get to see who's presenting. Um, what I'm going to talk to you, I guess there's four parts to my presentation today. Watershed planning, watershed processes, watershed analysis, and I'm gonna do a case study on Kerbrook Watershed, which is located at uh, Army Base Gagetown in Southern New Brunswick. So for many of you, what I'm gonna be presenting today will be a bit of a review, but as a, a friend of mine, Richard Van Ingen likes to say, you hope for a few nuggets of information when you, when you see these presentations or you go to a training course. So I hope you find a few nuggets that uh, you can use in your watersheds. So first I wanna talk about watershed management plans. Um, so, Watershed planning approach is a flexible framework for managing water resources, quality and quantity within a specific drainage area or watershed. I, I think most of us watching understand what a watershed is. A watershed plan is a strategy that assesses the state of a watershed, presents detailed management information in terms of analysis, action, participants, and resources required for developing and implementing the plan. So you see here, I've gotten red, focus on the water. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of watershed planning processes, primarily when I was with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And, and uh, it's very easy to get diverted off the water. Um, solar panels are important. Bicycle trails are important. Deer wintering habitat's important. Probably shouldn't be part of your watershed plan. But it is key, important with the watershed plan to, to make it specific to the issues in your watershed. So some of the steps in the watershed planning process uh, build partnerships. Obviously that's important because you need everyone to agree on um, what needs to be done and that's where you get your money, that's where you get people to do the work and uh, also access to the land and to the water. You need to characterize the watershed. So that's gathering the data, identify the causes of habitat degradation and what your knowledge gaps are. You need to finalize your goals and identify solutions. So the first thing is a vision statement, and I'm, I'm big into vision statements, but what I like, I like a vision statement that paints a real pretty picture. Like if you close your eyes and you hear a vision statement, you wanna see, see a nice picture of what you want your watershed to look like. So for me, a bad vision statement would be something like implementation of a process to remediate ecosystem components for the benefit of watershed stakeholders. That doesn't tell me a lot. I want a vision statement that includes things like free flowing waters, healthy salmon populations, water safe for swimming. That, that's the kind of visions I wanna see in a watershed vision statement. Uh, next, you need to, to develop some overall goals. And these are qualitative statements. So it could be no barriers, 
uh, clean water, that kind of thing. And then finally, come up with your targets or objectives. And these are accomplishments that are quantifiable. So again, it could be something like we want, we want to eliminate all barriers to fish passage. Uh, we want water quality that meets or exceeds uh, provincial or federal guidelines. The other thing is, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the presentation, is focus on the landscape processes that form and sustain quali high quality habitat. And, and so this is bigger than, say, replacing a culvert. It's looking at how do we maintain connectivity in our watershed. Uh, as we go on, so the next step would be designing and implementing a program. So this is your schedule, your technical financial needs, monitoring program, and who has responsibility for doing what. Then you're going to implement your watershed plan. Then you've got to measure the progress and make adjustments. So this is where you're monitoring, analyzing your data, reporting on it, and then adjusting to it. Adapt, and that's the adaptive management process. And this is probably one where a lot of us fall down on is we don't, we don't do a good enough job of measuring our progress. Another point in red for you, inclusive planning process is as important as the plan. So like I said, I've been involved in a lot of watershed planning processes and, uh, and watershed plans, and I've come to the conclusion that the planning process is just as important as the plan itself. Because you can write the perfect watershed plan, but if the important players haven't been involved in developing it, they're probably not going to be want to be involved in, in promoting it and implementing it. So that's why the, the planning process is so important. So you got to make sure you have you know, all levels of government involved, have your First Nations involved, have your, your landowners involved in industry and, and agriculture and whoever else is in the watershed. Very important. So let's take a look at some of the watershed processes. Uh, connectivity is one that, that's very important. And there, of course, there's longitudinal connect, conductivity, connectivity we should be looking at up and downstream, but don't just think of fish being able to get through a culvert or over a dam. Think about sediment transport and think about your coarse woody debris moving down through the watershed. Uh, lateral connectivity is also important. So this is the water course and its connectivity to the floodplain. This is things like ephemeral habitats, nutrients, sediment exchange, coarse woody debris, and water storage. And of course, there's vertical connectivity. Uh, this is surface to groundwater. So this is where we get our cold water sources, our base flows, and nutrient exchange. Uh, next is the hydrological processes. Uh, so this is your channel forming flows, uh, nutrient transport, sediment transport, and then your low flow conditions. Another note here in red is nail the hydrology. And I, I forget, I took a course and it was, uh, it was an engineer who gave it, but that was his statement through the whole course, nail the hydrology. Because if you're going to be doing work on a water course and you don't have the hydrology correct, you're probably going to end up with failures. And so for example, if you put in too small of a culvert, or if you do some in-stream restoration work and it, it can't handle the, the flows you're getting, or if it's too big for the site, you could do some serious damage. So, so nail the hydrology is another take home message. Next watershed process I want to talk about a little bit is erosion and sedimentation. So Obviously, you know, erosion is a natural process. It's an important part of the, the watershed processes. But uh, typically, what we're looking at is excessive erosion is a problem. Um, but, you know, this is how we get our substrate in streams and, and bed load movement, suspended sediments, and that, and that kind of thing. They're all, all important and all issues we want to deal with. Next is uh, the riparian zones and forests. So I think we all know the importance of riparian zones and forests to our watersheds. And it certainly, you know, it has a big impact on the hydrology, uh, erosion, nutrients, coarse woody debris, and uh, water temperature. Of course, obviously water quality, another one. Uh, you know, we can look at nutrient cycling and temperature and that. And the final one, we don't think about too much as a, as a process is the biological impacts to habitat. I'm not talking about just the animals doing their thing, but, but the impacts that they're having to habitat. For example, beavers, you know, building dams and beaver ponds, uh, gas and sea lamp prey, providing ocean derived nutrients, muskrats creating openings in wetland vegetation, and even wild ungulates browsing riparian vegetation can be huge. Not so much a, a big issue on the East Coast, but uh, if any of you have read about or, or seen documentaries about Reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone Park, and how they they pushed the um, 
the elk out of the uh, out of the valleys, which allowed the riparian willows and dogwoods and other vegetation to regrow, and and there's a whole cascade effect to to other wildlife and fish. So another thing to point out, of course, is all these watershed processes are linked and overlapping, and, and there's probably some others that you can think of. So next thing is watershed analysis and, and what we have to look at in a watershed when we're, we're developing a watershed plan. So an obvious one is water crossings and barriers. So how many water crossings are there? What's their condition? What's the location in the watershed? Often we think of water crossings as fisheries people were interested. Can a fish get through it? Is it a barrier to fish passage? But water crossings, particularly ditches and row beds, are a principal pathway for excess runoff and sediment laden water to enter water courses. And as I talked about in connectivity as well, undersized culverts and dams interfere with the downstream movement of sediment and woody debris. So if you look at the photo on the left, there's a perfect example. Uh, upstream of this, this road, the water is clear. Downstream, uh, this is what you have just from water, uh, dirty water running off the road. On the right, uh, it's a big debris jam, about 25 foot high. Uh, that water crossing had four or five culverts. Uh, it washed out during the storm, not as much because of the flow of water, but because of the amount of the debris blocking the, the culvert. There's now a single uh, open bottom arch there that allow the debris to flow through. Something else you can do is you can look at habitat suitability of, uh, of your watershed and, and water courses. Uh, so on the left there, that's habitat suitability index models that you can do and it, it lists a, a, a variety of techniques you can use to, to assess the watershed. And then on the right, ecological restoration of degraded aquatic habitats, watershed approach. This is a DFO document, it's produced in, in Atlantic Canada. It's a very good document um, if you're looking for ideas to, to monitor and, and assess the quality of your, your water courses. Something else that I recommend, and maybe a lot of people don't don't consider, is identifying unmapped headwater areas and and, and assessing those as well. Uh, these areas are less likely to be protected or to be buffered. Uh, and when I'm talking about unmapped headwaters, also think about your sewer sheds. We know a sewer dumps into a stream. Well, where's that water coming from? Find that out. Think of your agricultural drains and tile drainage. Uh, these areas they're a source of excess flows, sediment, and pollutant laden water. So in this photo here, what it is, so in red is what's the mapped water course. In blue is what's known as a, it's wet areas mapping. And this is a LIDAR based and digital elevation models. Uh, in this case, this, this mapping was produced by University of New Brunswick. And I believe uh, uh, wet areas mapping, I know, uh, I believe it's available in Nova Scotia now. I think Alberta has it. And uh, it's being developed for New Brunswick for the whole province is my understanding. Uh, it's it's an incredible tool because, you know, like I said, you can you can see from this photo all these little drainages that, that could be impacted that may not be protected. And I actually, I, it's more important to me than, than a stream layer. Next thing you should consider is the percent forest cover, percent imperviousness, and riparian zones in your watershed. Um, the evidence is generally fairly consistent, certainly in the northern hemisphere in the northern hemisphere and for forested landscapes, that as you remove the forest cover, uh, it has an impact on the watershed. And I've seen studies, you know, like eight to twenty percent of the forest cover removed anywhere in the watershed. It doesn't have to be, you know, in the riparian zone, you're gonna see negative impacts to to your, your watershed health and stream health. And so this is a important, it's a it's a good broad measure of what's, what's the likely health of your watershed. And so as we see this diagram, this is from uh, Maryland, and it's almost too good, but you can see as the impervious cover increases, so impervious, that would be paved areas, uh, houses, roofing, but it could include gravel roads, gravel parking lots. So as, as that increases, the stream health rating decreases. And same thing as the watershed tree cover and the buffer zone tree cover, decreases, we see that the stream health rating decreases. Obviously, another thing you want to assess is, is your water quality. Um, in a way, you can do that. There, there's certainly the, the CCME guidelines, provincial guidelines, or CCME water quality index. There's something called the severity of ill effects to fish due to turbidity. I've got the reference there. 
if you want to look at whether the amount of turbidity you have in your water is having a harmful effect. Um, and then you can look at measures of water quality and base flows and high flows and that kind of thing. And these two tables, they're from that, that, that DFO document I, I showed earlier, uh, gives an example of, of uh, some flows you should see for healthy semonid habitat. Uh, depending on your funds and, and your abilities, there's certainly more technical things you can do. Uh, hydrological models are an important tool. Uh, in this case, we, we've used something called the soil water assessment tool at uh, base gauge town. And it'll predict the effect of management decisions on water, sediment, nutrient, pesticide yields with reasonable accuracy on a large ungauged river basin. And so this allows you to model the watershed. And, and what you can do is you can say, okay, if we have 50% forest in our watershed now, what would happen if we could increase that to 75%? How would that change our yields of sediment going in the stream or our flows? And it'll model that for you. Um, so again, a good tool and it gives you some ideas of management actions you should you should attempt or or how much work you're going to have to do to make a change. Uh, that's that's one example. There's other examples. There's revised universal soil loss equation, uh, HECRAS. There's all kinds of different models you can use, but again, it, it, they are fairly technical and require some specialized uh, uh, expertise to use them. Another one many of you probably seen is the thermal infrared remote sensing. Uh, this is an interesting tool. Uh, it shows uh, cold water and warm water, dif differentiates uh, water temperature based on aerial photography. Um, it, it's interesting, it's great. So if you look on, on the right side there, the area in black, that would be the cold water entering the warmer red water. Uh, water is colored in red to show that it's warmer. Uh, it is, it is expensive. It only looks at surface waters. Uh, it will help you identify those, those important cold water refuge areas or cold water sources. Uh, I'll give you, give you the punchline. It's mostly the, the tributaries, uh, the end to point bars, and occasionally there's seeps at, on the side bends. Um, but certainly your tributaries are going to be your main sources. And you, you, know, you can find those off maps and, and send some students out and take some temperatures for you. Uh, something we've just started uh, last couple of years we've been trying is uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, UAVs or, or drones and some of the technology available with that and what's opening up. And we, we've done something um, with a consultant called Multi Spectral Photog Photogrammy for Watershed Disturbance Analysis. And basically, they're using the drone to, to fly, take photos, and uh, they can map the vegetation, the soil conditions, and determine areas of high erosion potential. Um, Again, very expensive, very specialized, but but it's an incredibly powerful tool. They're they're measuring changes like um, you know 15, 30 centimeter differences in, in in elevation, and then detecting whether that's exposed soil or, or the condition of the vegetation. And of course, there's biological monitoring that you're going to do too, and that's your your benthic invertebrates fisheries, and and don't forget your freshwater mussels. They are a good indicator species. So next, we'll move on. I'll tell you a little bit about Fifth Canadian Division Support Base Gage Town. It's uh, located in South Central New Brunswick. It was established in the 1950s, and it's the home of the Army's Combat Training Center, uh, the Canadian Forces School of Military Engineering, and several military units. It's approximately 1,100 square kilometers in size, which is about 3% of the province of New Brunswick. Uh, it includes 21,000 hectares of maneuver area which on the, uh, the map on the right, that would be the area in white, kind of in central part of the map. Uh, 30,000 hectares of impact areas. So that would be anything shown in red. And that's where the live fire exercises take place. Um, there's approximately 4,600 military people and 800 civilian personnel there. It just, just depends, it, it varies a little bit. Uh, everything, everything in green is forested. So it's about 70% forest and 30% uh, cleared lands. So some of the training activities we do at Base Gage Town. Uh, so on the top left, uh, that's what we would call mounted maneuvers, which would be anything using a vehicle. So it could be light armored vehicles, which although we call them light armored vehicles, are you know 18 to 35 tons. Uh, tanks are around, I think they're up to 70 tons now. Um, so that'd be a mounted maneuver. Dismounted maneuver would be soldiers on foot, shown in the, the right photo. 
as well. We also have the 403 helicopter squadron there at the base. Uh, we do some on-water training. The Army Dive Center is located there. And uh, so there's on-water training and in-water training. And uh, lots of live fire. So everything, you know, small, small arms, machine guns, uh, heavy artillery, uh, tanks, and also aerial bombing. So the Canadian Army mission. Canadian Army will generate combat effective multi-purpose land forces to meet Canada's defense objectives. So that, that's the mission of the Army. I think that's important to understand what what the whole purpose of base gauge down is to generate combat effective multi-purpose uh, soldiers. Basically, it's it's to training area for soldiers. That's what it's for. Uh, we do have a, an environmental policy to conduct our activities in an environmentally sustainable way, demonstrate due diligence, comply with applicable environmental legislation and national defense environmental policies, and improve our environmental performance. Next, we'll move into the, uh, the case study for Kerbrook. So Kerbrook, uh, on the, the map, it's shown in the, the small square there. It's, it's located within the mountain maneuver area. Uh, the Warsha area is a total of about 20 kilometers squared. There's up to 2,000 training events per year take place uh, within that area. And on average, there's about 38 military vehicles per day in the watershed. So that's an average per day uh, in the winter, generally fewer vehicles. Fall and spring, it's real busy. That's when most of our, our training takes place is in the fall and spring. And unfortunately, that's when you're going to get your most erosion and and, uh, and and issues. But it's just the way that the training cycle works. If we look at Kerbrook, so the watershed land cover, it's about 26% forested, 36% is shrubs or young trees, 32% uh, grasslands, 4% exposed soils, and 2% wetlands. Uh, riparian zones, 21% forested, 47% shrubs, 27% grass, 5% bare soil or water. So if you look at the map, you can see most of the forest is actually concentrated in two areas. So at the northeast, uh, that's uh, that square there. We call that Scotty Dog Wood, and I think you'll be able to, to figure out why it's called that. And at the bottom left is another big forest area. And then a few other patches of forest, mostly along a couple of uh, the main stems of the watercourse. It's still very, very low forest cover. And part of this, for the military training, they, they want cleared areas. So this is the struggle of someone trying to manage impacts for fisheries. You know, I, I want more forest and, and they kind of want less forest, but that's that's what they require for training. Uh, so the total water course length is about 48.6 kilometers. There's no dams or significant barriers in this watershed. 16 in-stream culverts, 93 fording locations, and 174 kilometers of roads and trails. So because they are maneuvering across country, uh, they're using a lot of trails, which are, they're, they're a trail. They're not maintained for the most part, um, although we'll, we'll see some maintenance that we do. And, um, and they are fording water courses because, uh, you know, in, in a real life exercise, there's not a bridge everywhere. It's more about the water, watershed. You see the discharge here, very flashy flows. And you can imagine it, it is a very steep, uh, not, not steep by by BC standards, but for New Brunswick, there's a lot of hills, and and so and with the vegetation clearing, we do get a lot of rapid runoff, uh, flashy flows, and the average annual peak flow is greater than five times the daily mean flow. And that that was one of the um, from the previous uh, slides I showed you. It said you know if it was over five times the daily flow of the annual peak flow, that that was a sign of poor poor conditions for semonids. Uh, turbidity, again, with these high flow events, we get high turbidity. Uh, we get TSS recordings up to 185 milligrams per liter. I'm sure it's gone higher than that. That's just what we've recorded. Uh, but there's no other significant exceedance of CCME water quality guidelines. It's really just sediment would be our own real pollutant. There's, there's no industry or anything. It's a military training area, right? So there's no agriculture industry, anything like that, or urban development. Uh, fish species, American eel, Atlantic salmon, uh, just one old record, brown bullhead, brook trout, sea lamprey, smallmouth bass, and various bait fish. Uh, this this watershed it does uh, it's tributary to the Narapis River, which is uh, which is a salmon salmon river. And I assume historically there was probably salmon 
uh, in Kerr Brook as well. So this is kind of a, a, a close-up photo of what you might see if you're if you're out in the training area in the Kerbrook watershed. So at the top of the photo, the light green, it'd be um, uh, grasses, some scattered shrubs growing, uh, some trails going going through. They come together. You can see they're they're crossing the watercourse uh, at one point and uh, continuing on the riparian zone. Uh, more dense wetland grasses, lots of shrubs, but not a lot of forest. It, the land was cleared, and, and like I said, they wanted it cleared, and so it was cleared in the 50s, and they wouldn't have cons considered themselves concerned themselves too much with riparian zones, that kind of thing, back in the 50s. And you can see there's trails. If you look closely, there's there's trails kind of going everywhere, um, but most of them, uh, in recent years, in the last 20 years, they've really started to concentrate more on individual trails, in part because it's not good to be crossing the brooks everywhere. So that's kind of what it looks like and what we're working with. So I talked a whole bunch about watership plans, watership processes. So where's the Kerbrook Watership Management Plan? Well, it doesn't exist. So this is a, a situation where it's do as I say, not as I do. Uh, the reason we don't have a specific Kerbrook Watershed plan is because we have one landowner, we have one land use, minimal development, one source of funding. Uh, we have our own internal environmental compliance and conformance team. And we don't have any real specific significant interest in this watershed from external stakeholders. Um, but we do have other base Y plants that are applicable to the Kerbrook watershed. So one of them we do have, uh, uh, it's called Strategies for the Management of Fisheries, Aquatic and Habitat, apply CDSB gauge channel. This, this is sort of our fisheries and aquatic habitat management plan for the base. Uh, the vision, a sustainable and realistic military training environment where healthy aquatic habitats support diverse self-sustaining aquatic communities including species at risk, capable of contributing to recreational, commercial, and Aboriginal fisheries. Uh, some of you, you're, you're going to see some key words in there that come from, you know, Species at Risk Act, uh, the, the Federal Fisheries Act, and, and this is because we are a military training area. Our mandate is training soldiers, you know, so a compliance is a big thing. Um, so is this a good vision? You know, I talked about a beautiful picture and what you want to see. Uh, I don't know. Not too bad, maybe not perfect. Uh, we also have another plan, five Canadian Division Sport Base Gauge Town Sedimentation and Erosion Control Plan. So the goals there are environmental stewardship and compliance, sustainable range and training areas. So I think these are good uh, qual qualitative goals. Uh, objective, minimize and mitigate erosion and sedimentation by implementing high priority projects. Sure, applicable regulations, policies, compliance issues are met by minimizing and mitigating sedimentation effects in a realistic training environment where activities are conducted in a compliant, sustainable manner. So when you when you see these, you might think, oh, can you really measure that? And yeah, you can. You know, the, the first bullet, implementing high priority projects. Well, we, we, we can count and keep track of the number of projects we're implementing. Um, you know, we want to mitigate sedimentation effects. We are trying to, to measure, are we reducing the erosion and sedimentation? And then are military activities conducted in a compliant manner? Uh, we are measuring, you know, we keep track of it when there's uh, non-compliant maneuvers or military training, we will do an internal report. And uh, so that is tracked. So what are we doing about it? Well, when we look at some of our management actions, one thing we have what's called range standing orders. And these are the rules for using the training area. So, so something that we brought in uh, no fording of watercourses or wetlands except at engineered hardened fords. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of those later. Uh, we have 30 meter buffer zones with no maneuvering or vegeta vegetation management uh, with that around wetlands, watercourses, and also around the wet areas mapping. So if you recall that, that previous photo uh, showing the wet areas mapping beyond the watercourses, we also buffer those. And then recently we brought in a, a course that soldiers must complete uh, maneuver damage prior to doing the training at, at Gagetown. Uh, so what this course tells them is, hey, you have to avoid the buffer zones. You have to use the hardened fords. And so we did, and we've also produced a map. Um, so those red dots, that would be hardened fords where they're allowed to cross the water course. And the blue shows the buffer zones, which are kind of uh, no mount, mounted maneuvers in those areas. So those are some of the, the management actions we've taken. Uh, we definitely have to work on making sure that everyone follows them. It's a bit of a challenge. 
Something else we've done as far as physical route works is uh, road improvement. So within Kerbrook Watershed, eight of the 16 in-stream culverts have been replaced so far. Uh, we're capping the roads, ditching, installing cross culverts and offtake construction has been completed for 6.7 kilometers out of 9.6 kilometers of roads. And, um, and these designs are based on the New Brunswick Watercourse Wetland Certification Training Guidelines. And uh, also they're, under, they're done under a permit from the province. Uh, so now I got another note in red for you. Break the hydraulic pathway. So th this is a big thing. Uh, it's your water coming off the landscape that brings the pollutants to your watercourse often. So if you think of a ditch that's running down a roadside, carrying sediment, carrying uh, could be metals or oil or whatever coming off your road or out your sewer and into the watercourse. So you got to break that hydraulic pathway. Uh, so for example, breaking the pathway here, capping the road with, with gravel, that, that breaks a path between the rainfall or runoff, uh, hitting those fine sediments and creating real erosion on your road, getting down to the, the water course. Uh, what you want to do, and also you want the road to be, to be graded so that tire in the middle, and the water runs off into the ditches. And then uh, it's, it's kind of hard to see on the, the photo on the left here, but that, that ditch has berms down through it which stops the water from flowing down the ditch. And then you can see on the photo on the right, uh, you can see a bit of the berm on the right side. That water hits the berm and it's diverted into vegetation where hopefully all the sediment and any pollutants settle out before they ever make it to the water course. So that's breaking that pathway between the land, the land and the road and, and your, your water course. Um, very easy to do these, these offtakes, very easy to do when you're the landowner, you know, on both sides of the road. A lot more difficult when you have a public road and, and private land on either side. But uh, these, these techniques are used by forestry. Any forest road guideline will have these same techniques in it. So other things we've done in the Kerbrook watershed. So we've provided uh, 20 hardened fords within the watershed, 44 wetland crossings, uh, done 21 ditch crossings, so where they can access the exit the road and enter the, the training area. Uh, we've blocked 207 trails, we've decommissioned 73 fording sites, we've done 10 tributary repairs, so those will be little headwater streams or whatever that have been damaged by vehicles uh, or tanks, and so we've repaired those. And then we've got 491 other associated installation uh, techniques that we use, it could be signage and other things. And so we actually have a whole, we call it our Ford for uh, maintenance and decommissioning toolbox, which outlines a whole list of techniques that we use for, for working on forwards and trails. And we developed that with the uh, help from DFO. And, and we do, again, all this work under permit. So this would be an example of, of an improved forward. So if you look at the photo on the left, all of this, it's a, it's a mud trail going through Kerr Brook. Um, you can imagine how much sediment's running down through there when it, when a you have a tank or an armored vehicle crossing or during a rain event. On the right, this is the improved forts. We actually excavate out uh, about a half a meter of mud and fill it with rock. We use geotextile with R25 rock on top and then a layer of uh, crushed stone on top of that. Um, and then at the top of the photo on the right, you can barely see it. There's a little hump just where the, 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 the dirt trail meets the gravel. Uh, that's a water bar and deflects the water into the offtake and again hopefully any dirty water uh, is filtered out or settles before it makes it to the water course. Something else we've done in the watershed, uh, we've constructed approximately seven hectares of wetlands and of course they help with sediment removal, uh, they provide some wildlife habitat. Most of these are done in headwater areas, they're, they're not on line so they're, they're or in non-fish bearing uh, ephemeral channels, if there is even a, a channel there, or they're built offline, so they're not interfering with fish passage, and uh, they're not having a temperature impact. And of course, tree planting is, uh, is always important. We haven't done a lot of it in Kerbrook watershed, um, but we have done some small projects, you know, hundreds of trees. And this would be along gullies or decommissioned fords, or possibly some infill planting. Something else we did as a, as a trial uh, was using an in-stream sediment collector. <clears throat> and what this does, uh, if you look at the top photo on the right, it's, it's a big basin that's uh, placed under the stream bed. 
and with these two grates on top. And so if you look at the lower left photo, that's what it looks like when it's installed. And uh, during storm events, the bed load is diverted and goes up the ramp. And then those, there's two graded slots on top and the fines fall in and the, the coarse material continues on downstream. So you're not interfering with sediment transport of the coarse materials that for semi-onids are the ones you want to keep. <coughs> and then uh, eventually, uh, you know, typically once a year, uh, you go in and you you pump the fine sediment out. Uh, like I said, we did this as a as a trial. It was fairly expensive. Uh, it was over fifty thousand for for the unit and the installation. Uh, it does require a lot of maintenance. The, the grates clog up, and uh, you know you need to do the annual pumping. And and the way we're set up, uh, we have to use a pump truck, and we have to wait till low flow so we can get it the the the, the manhole cover and, and pump it out. And that's probably a couple thousand a year to bring a pump truck in. So as far as a tool to reduce sediment in a stream, uh, as in general, probably not not worthwhile. Uh, where it might be good, certainly if you're doing a scientific project and you want to monitor uh, that type of material would be good. Or if you had a specific site, maybe you have an agricultural drain coming in. There's just you know nothing you can do there, but you want to maintain fish passage and um, it maybe it'd be suitable for a site like that, but it does take a lot of maintenance. So let's let's talk about uh, measuring our progress. So, so one of the things we did, uh, we used the revert, revised universal soil loss equation to look at what was the impact of our Ford improvements in the Kerbrook watershed. So we looked at 41 hard Ford approaches. It's like one I showed you in, in the photo there. And uh, there's 20 Fords, and a, an approach is coming from each side to the watercourse crossing to the Ford. So each Ford has two approaches, except we had one Ford that had three for some reason. Uh, so what we found out, hardening the Ford approaches reduces erosion by 98%, annual reduction of 32.4 tons of eroded soil entering the watercourse, and a 9% reduction in the total watershed sediment yield. Uh, so this is a model, obviously, you know, it's, it's an estimate. But it's still, it's nice to have these numbers. And, and it's kind of obvious if you take a muddy trail and you turn it into a rock trail, there's going to be less erosion. But I do think it's still important to, to provide these numbers. These, these are the things that, that your funding people want to see or, or you know, the, the senior leadership. They want to see numbers like this. And I think it's helpful. Another thing we looked at was uh, the impact of uh, uh, improving forwards on the turbidity level. So. In this case, we use automated continuous sampling of turbidity every 15 minutes of a four pre and post improvement. So when it was just a mud trail and then after it was hardened. Uh, this wasn't by no means, this was not great science, but but it, it, it's demonstrated. Uh, so pre-construction, post-construction, we see we had three. These were non-precipitation turbidity events. So so what these are, uh, we know is a vehicle crossing the, the, the Ford, using the Ford that caused the turbidity because it wasn't raining. What we see beforehand, uh, the average duration was 2.16 hours. After we hired the forward, it was down to 1.9 hours, where the turbidity went above uh, the background or upstream turbidity level. And then we see significant reductions in the in the peak uh, turbidity and the peak recorded turbidity. Again, this was one site. Uh, you're going to get different answers at every site, but but it's it's demonstrative of that. Yes, this is making a difference. So we move into habitat monitors. We look at curb brooks. We looked at some of the substrate data, uh, geometric mean particle size. So that's the size of the, the substrate and whether the embeddedness. So if you take a rock, how much of the rock is surrounded? How, how deep is that rock buried in the, the fines? Um, if you look at geometric mean particle size, you'll see it was kind of high. And then 2014, we had a beaver dam growth upstream. And you can see the, the, the size dropped dramatically. And it started to make a comeback. And now 2018 it dropped again. I, there may have been more beaver activity. I'm not sure what happened exactly. But it, it's, uh, I guess there's two points here. There's no real trend. So out of, you know, we've done this work, but we're not seeing any trend in the, in the difference in these measures anyway. But it is interesting to see the impact of the beaver dam. Uh, so that's something, something to have of it anyway. Uh, turbidity measurements on Kerbrook. Uh, again, just, you, you can look at the numbers, but there's, again, no real trend. 
no real trend in the change of turbidity. Biological monitoring. So one of our sites uh, up top, you can see we, we replaced a culvert there just downstream of that site in 2010. And we started to see increase in brook trout numbers. I got all excited. And then in 2015, we had a storm come in and it blew out, it changed the stream down, uh, downstream of the culvert, blew out a riffle and our, our culvert kind of became perched. Uh, we tried to fix up the riffle, but it seems pretty clear that it, it's not working. Uh, so I think the numbers there, what they're indicating is in problems with that culvert. The, the fish just are not getting through it. They're not getting to the spawning areas and, and the numbers are way down. Uh, percent EPT, so that's your, your mayflies, uh, stoneflies and, and caddisflies. Uh, quite a bit of good, good sample data set there. Almost, uh, well, for over, looks like 11 years we total, uh, not, not every year. Uh, no dramatic trend. It might be increasing a little bit, but again, no, nothing really stands out or obvious. Uh, some other graphs I want to show you. Uh, so this is base wide data. So this is outside Kerr Brook. Um, at the lower left, we see it's percent EPT in our invertebrate, uh, benthic invertebrate data, uh, compared to the number of upstream forward crossings. And it almost appears that the more forward crossings you have, the better uh, EPT you have. Of course, it's not significant, so I wouldn't read too much into it. I wouldn't read anything into it, actually. But but it is interesting when you when you look at the the data on the right. When we look at the percent of unforested upstream area versus EPT. We do have a significant relationship, and of course, it, uh, the EPT is declining as you reduce the amount of forest. And same with road and track coverage. As the percentage of the washer that that has roads and tracks. Um, increases the EPT, EPT decreases. So uh, it's one year, but it, it kind of suggests that maybe it's these landscape factors that are really driving, certain, at least the, these aquatic inverters are driving their populations, not so much the, the in-stream thing, for example, like the number of ford crossings. So what can we say about the case study on, on Kerbrook Marsh? Well, we did implement measures that improve compliance and show due diligence. So for example, when I talk about, you know, our forward toolbox was developed with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, uh, replacing the collars to make sure we have fish patch, that kind of thing. That, that's, that's a compliance thing. That's a compliance issue. So we're, we're doing our best. We're showing due diligence. Uh, and the literature and the modeling suggests that measures should enhance our watershed processes, or at least, you know, reducing some of our erosion and sedimentation. However, when we look at the actual measures of habitat and some of the biological measures, we're not getting conclusive evidence of anything happening. Um, so what does that tell us? Maybe maybe we're targeting the wrong things, or or maybe it's just the natural variability. Uh, it, it's hard to uh, tease that stuff out. Um, so I don't know. We're we're gonna we're gonna look at a few different ways of doing some monitoring. I think look more at turbidity and maybe some of the bed bed composition and see what we can get from that. Obviously, you know, and, and, and this is an example where we're modeling helps because it allows you to control the natural variability and say, okay, if we change one thing, what should we expect to happen? So summary, I think I had 40, looks like 45 slides there. Uh, here's a good summary provided by someone else. Uh, number one, protect your areas with impact, intact processes and high quality habitat. Uh, reconnect your isolated high quality habitat. Restore your hydrological and geological processes. Restore your riparian processes. And then conduct in, conduct in-stream habitat enhancement where short-term improvements are needed. So last one, what they're implying there is, and this is where we've talked about, I've mentioned, you know, focus on restoring your watershed processes. Because uh, your in-stream really is a short-term solution. But sometimes you need it, for example, if you have no, your objective is to have a riparian forest. So you plant trees. But it's going to be 75 years before your riparian forest that you've just planted is going to be producing coarse woody debris. So in that situation, maybe you do need some digger logs or deflectors or cover logs or whatever, whatever you choose to do to provide that coarse woody debris. Anyway, so that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for, for everyone who's, uh, who's watching. I guess we're ready for questions.
Thank you so much, Andy. That was a great overview of the watershed planning process and also some of the unique challenges that, um, that, that you're currently working with. That's great. Um, so as Andy said, we'll open up the floor now for a question and answer. So you've got a couple of options if you'd like to ask a question. You can use your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box you should be seeing in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Um, if it's minimized, just hit the orange arrow and that will enlarge it. Um, so if you'd like to use the audio of your computer, um, just you can click on the yellow hand icon, um, which will allow you to raise your hand and we can open up your microphone. Um, and you can ask your question directly, or you can also type in your question um, and I'll read it aloud. So we'll give folks a few minutes um, to get their questions in. Uh, one quick question I did have for you, Andy, was it does seem that there is a whole uh, follow-up monitoring process that's that's integrated in your overall program. Is that is that standard like throughout all of the watersheds that, that you're working with? Um, no, we, we've really focused on the Kerr Brook as kind of a model watershed just because it's right in the middle of the maneuver area. It's one of the most highly impacted one. We do, we do monitoring in other watersheds as well and associated with projects. Um, and certainly, you know, I didn't talk about the Narapus River that much, um, but it, it's the main tributary flowing off of base gauge down. So we, we do some monitoring there and, and, and all over. And we, we, I've just touched on a little stuff that I, I do. Like we have um, uh, water chemistry monitoring it sort of around the outside of the base or right at the base boundaries of all the watershed water courses flowing off the base. Uh, just uh, it's, it's an incredible amount of monitoring actually that goes on. Great, thank you. Um, so we do have a few questions that have come in now. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Claudie Lachance who asks, do you know if there is any similar watershed monitoring and management in the Valcartier garrison? Uh, yeah, yes there is. Uh, if you contact them, uh, Pierre um, would be does some work on uh, on the water courses there. Um, I'm not sure exactly what what they're doing, but but uh, if you contact uh, Valcarche, they can they can put you in touch with the right people. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Robert Battis Jr., uh, who asks, "What was the minnow-like fish species shown in uh, one of your slides?" Uh oh. So a question or a challenge? I believe it's a dub. <laughs> Great, thank you. I, you passed the challenge. Um, the next question comes from John Coxick, who asks, uh, you had an HSI score on one of your slides that listed multiple species. I may have missed it, but what species was that for? Oh, so the habitat suitability index, that would have been for brook trout. Great, thank uh, you. I say that now, it might have been for brook trout or it might have just been for salmonids in general. I, I think it was brook trout. Great, great, thank you. Um, so the next question comes from Elisa Bernier who asks, uh, hi Andy, I'm wondering if you have any specifications, heights, widths, and other design parameters for the creek ditch crossing structures? Uh, for, for the, okay, so there's ditch crossings and then there's boards. I'm not sure which one she's looking for, but yes, but maybe she, I, my, my email address is on there. If she wants to contact me directly, I can provide her something. Great, excellent, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Kirk McDonald, uh, who asks, how do you determine which crossings get hardened fords versus which ones get structures? Are the hardened fords only used on trails? So what we did is, is um, we really looked at it a few things. The, the number one thing we looked at was which ones are they using? So the military tend to use the same trails over and over again and and they have certain training exercises they use and and so we we targeted the ones that they use the most and we decommissioned the other ones um, unless there was a situation where it was going through a real ecologically sensitive area or it was really steep and we just knew it it, it just wasn't sustainable then we decommission it. Um, but tip, for the most part, it was which ones are they using the most? 
Great, thank you. Uh, we now have a comment from Mike Hunka, uh, who writes, thanks, Andy. One option that might be worth exploring for breaking the hydraulic pathways associated with ditches would be to construct willow wattles, interspace down the ditch line to trap sediment and slow flows, which can save on cross-drain installation costs. Yeah, yeah thanks, that's a good idea. I'm, I'm familiar with willow wattles. Um, I don't think our engineer would, would appreciate those. Uh, they want to get the water away from the road as fast as possible and we spend we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars clearing vegetation away from the roads um, mostly for sight lines for safety so good idea um, i'm not sure i would i would get to agreement with that thank you uh, the next question is from bruce walker how many monitoring sites include flow discharge me measurements that can be used for calculating loadings? Oh my gosh, Bruce. I'm not sure if that's the Bruce I know. That's a tough question. Um, sorry, can you repeat it again for me? Yep. How many monitoring sites include flow discharge measurements that can be used for calculating loadings? Okay, so we've done flow monitoring at various sites. Um, I don't have the total number right now. Certainly, we've done the Narapus River and Kerr Brook. Um, that would be the two main ones for sure. We've done it on some of the other tributaries to the Narapus River. I'm not sure if that's exactly what Bruce was looking for, but again, my email is there. If I haven't answered your question, feel free to contact me directly and we can discuss further. Thanks, Andy. Uh, the next question comes from Catherine Collette. Um, she asks, uh, is there good buy-in? And two, is there repercussion for non-compliance? Uh, so I would say senior command, we have good buy-in. And even the soldiers, you know, we have good buy-in. They want to be compliant. Um, the, so as a rule, it, certainly it does, it does interfere with training. Like, there, there's some aspects that interfere with trains, certainly like, you know, having to use a hardened forward, um, it, it's a constriction point for them. They want to be able to move across country, um, but they understand they have to follow it. The repercussions, yeah, certainly if, if we have a non-compliance, we, we do write up a report, it would go to their commanding officer and, uh, and it's also tracked through our, our system right up through to Ottawa. Um, and in most, some cases, certainly the, the offending unit would have to pay for repairs is, is the way we're trying to do it. And, uh, you know, in some, in some cases too, we will report, um, to fisheries and oceans or environment Canada as we are required under the, 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 the fisheries act, depending on the situation. Uh, and it's. I don't know how to explain that and say military culture to get a, a non-compliance is very serious. And so it is, it is just, just getting that piece of paper is a serious consequence. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I think our last question of the day comes from uh, Lisa Bernier who asks, could any of the land use practices in the watershed drainage area have affected the quality and quantity of groundwater inputs to the creek ditch? Yeah, uh, I, I would say so. I mean, it, you, you didn't see it from a picture, but we've had 50 years of military training. That, and when you, if, if anyway, you want to, if you're more interested, go on Google Earth tonight and you can look at it and it, uh, the air photo of the base and find it. And if you zoom in, you can see it's very compacted soil. It's like there's ruts uh, everywhere. And I, I feel like um, we're not getting as much groundwater infiltration as we as we would from a forest landscape or even a, a normal uh, landscape. So, so I think that's been one big impact on groundwater uh, in this watershed. And, and of course, you know, the associated impacts of groundwater upwelling and, and that kind of thing. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you very much again, Andy, for an excellent presentation. That was really fascinating. Um, just a 